Kia ora koutou, no mai, haere mai, and a very warm welcome to this important and timely discussion on countering misogyny. Ko su kejli aho. I'm facilitating the discussion today, which has been organised by the National Council of Women of New Zealand, Te Kou Nihira o Aotearoa. And the National Council of Women is a an umbrella group really of women's groups that are working to break down the barriers of discrimination and sexism in Aotearoa New Zealand and to create an open, uh, inclusive and gender equal society. But first I'd like to invite Mihina Rangi Forbes to open our webinar with a karakia. Yeah. Uh, matariki te tupua, matariki te tawhito, tau mai, te wairua, mai ngā ira atua ki te ira tangata tihei wā Māori ora. Kei ngā mate o te wā, haere, haere, haere atura, hoki anō ki a tātou te hunga ora tēnā koutou. Uh, te kauni hira wahine o Aotearoa tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou, ngā kaiwhaka haere sū mā koutou. Tēnā koutou i aku tukana, aku māre kura, uh, ko hui hui mai, uh, o tēnā marae, o tēnā iwi, o tēnā hapu, tēnā koutou, o te rā ki a koutou kato, uh, pai mariri ki a tātou. Tēnā koe, mahina rangi. Well, we're very fortunate to have four courageous and extremely qualified women on our panel today to discuss what's behind the rise in misogynistic abuse and attacks on women leaders, women in the public life, and women generally, and explore what can we do to protect women from these attacks. And some of our panelists themselves have been victims of online abuse. Sarah Templeton, for example, who's a Christchurch city councillor, successfully exposed who was behind online attacks against her by taking her case to the Supreme Court. Kate, Hanger, Kate Hanna, who's the director of the disinformation project Aotearoa, which has been researching the links between misogyny, racism and the far right, has just completed a powerful and very important paper on misogyny and its polarising and destructive impact on our political culture and society. Mihina Rangi Forbes is an award-winning journalist and host of TV3's current affairs programme, The Hui, while Alison Moore is the uh, senior journalist at Stuff and editor of the Me Too Project New Zealand. And of course, she's been investigating misogyny and sexual harassment in the workplace for many years. Well, the former Australian Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, was the victim of relentless misogynistic attacks throughout her term in government. And she says now, looking back, that her main regret is that she didn't call out the attacks against her earlier, much earlier, and that women's groups, community leaders, and men, in fact, didn't call a stop to the sexism and misogyny that she had to endure throughout her term as Prime Minister either and trigger a national debate about the issue. So her comments in her biography made me realise just how important it is that all of us stand up against the abuse against women and not just sort of silently put up with it as if it's an almost inevitable part of being a woman today. All women and girls should be protected from abuse, particularly at a time when there seems to be a growing global backlash against women's rights, as we have seen so starkly in America uh, this past week. And that's why the National Council of Women has this project as one of its priorities and is organising this webinar today. We hope that our discussion today will help to trigger a wider national conversation about this issue and put in place new protections for women and girls, especially against online abuse. So I'm going to be questioning uh, panel members for about an hour, then we'll open it up to your questions. So please send in your questions using the question and answer function on your screens because the chat function has been turned off. Well, if I could start with you, Sarah, 
The word misogyny describes not only the hatred of women, but also abusive behaviours that are intended to control, punish and silence women who challenge male dominance. And of course, much of it happens on social media and it affects women's well-being, their personal confidence and their mental health. So just to give our audience some idea of the impact that these online attacks can have on victims, can you describe what happened to you, Sarah, and the impact it had on your life? Uh, kia ora koutou, nā mihi nui, kia koutou. Um, thanks for that, Sue. Uh, yeah, so I've always had a bit of trolling uh, since I've been elected to council. Um, I'm relatively outspoken on hugely controversial things like cycleways um, and environmental concerns and climate change. And so that tends to attract a certain type of um, troll who you know, doesn't see those issues as a priority. And there's been times when that trolling has gone a bit further and that's what happened in this case last year. So last June, uh, a couple of what turned out to be fake accounts started um, trolling me initially on my Facebook page. And it got to the point where, you know, they were asking, they were making comments about me and other people um, asking about what, you know, whether I used environmental period products, those kind of things. And so I just blocked them. I try and I try and not block because I'm keen to have conversations with people and educate those kind of things. But it, it was clearly just trolling and um, designed to get a reaction. Once I blocked them, though, which is what you're advised to do, they... I, they decided to go wider. So they started sharing things um, of mine and about me on, um, on their pages, on the council Facebook page, on uh, my colleagues' Facebook pages, community pages, and then started um, messaging, which is, which is tough because you can't see that happening and you don't know what they're saying or to who. And they had uh, emailed a colleague saying, you know, you know, Sarah said that she's going to roll you as chair of the community board and, you know, she's just talking shit or is it really going to happen? And so the only way to protect myself and um, my reputation, I guess, and you know, I spent a lot of time building relationships with various community groups was to go public. Um, and so one of the things about being a counsellor is that you do, in some ways you're lucky because you've got enough profile that it's a story. And so I approached Tina Law um, a reporter who covers the council uh, for the press and told her the story and she um, they, they published it a few days later at which point my uh, harassment stopped the accounts were disabled and and I was able to take a deep breath I think it had been it had been really horrible it had been about three or four weeks of really intense stuff um, I'd lost sleep um, I'd missed some meetings, found myself teary in meetings and had to walk out a couple of times and go and cry in the loos, um, all of that kind of stuff. It's um, high anxiety because you don't know what's next. And, um, and so when it stopped, it gave me a chance to, to really recover. And, it, and it, you do need to spend some time recovering. Um, yeah, it, it, it was particularly unpleasant. Um, it coincided with a lockdown and so I had a bit more time to recover and I had some counselling which was really helpful and at that point I decided to take it further and find out who was behind the accounts and so I went through the, um, the civil process through the Humble Digital Communications Act um, through NetSafe initially and filed papers of the court in October went through a process there, there was a bit of to and fro with the court, a hearing, and finally um, in March we had the address of one of the accounts revealed, um, at which point it all went very public again, and um, yeah, it was it was amazing actually, I thought it was just going to be a sort of small local story, um, but it, it was much bigger than that, and it has ended up, you know, I've had a lot of contact from uh, people, mostly women, from across the country, uh, partly saying thanks and partly sharing their own experiences, um, and many of many of them um, who haven't had such success at finding out who's been behind harassment, and sometimes when they have, not being able to stop them um, using the current processes as well. 
I've had people contact me because their lawyers have suggested because the lawyers were struggling with the with the act and which box to tick and those kind of things. And so it's really clear that the the act itself and NetSafe um, aren't fit for purpose. And so I've decided to continue what I'm doing to try and get a review of the act um, and a review of NetSafe's processes to make sure that we can have a more victim centred approach that actually really does reduce harm. Fantastic. And we'll follow that up um, later on. But Kate, um, do you want to say anything about your abuse? I know you've uh, been the sub victim of a great deal of online abuse. Yeah, I guess um, slightly differently from, from Sarah in that um, as, a, as an academic studying something, you, you often don't expect yourself to even be important or talked about or, or you know, part of the public eye. But through the course of the pandemic, um, we've had a number of, of myself and my colleagues become quite high profile women talking about COVID-19 and talking about the disinformation, et cetera, around COVID-19. And that um, has contributed to, to a number of different individuals who are sort of part of the places that I study becoming um, pretty obsessed with, with following my movements and, and, and talking about me online. And, and like you said, Sarah, one of the things is that you can ignore it, um, but they're also talking about you and you don't know what they're saying and it's ruining your reputation or potentially harming your loved ones or it might involve revealing um, personal details about you. Know, most recently, one of the things I found really upsetting was um, a photograph of me, um, which myself and my team couldn't find a, a digital version of online. So it's not, you know, I don't know how this person got that photograph. I, I know where it was um, physically posted at my, at my former employer. So, so I, you know, it makes me feel really like somebody has been watching and following me for quite a long time and gathering information about me. It feels like stalking. And I know that's what it's intended to do. It's intended to make me be quiet and stop doing the work that I do. But it is, it is really distressing. And, and, you know, like you said, Sarah, one of the things is that, um, you know, I look at the legislation, um, both in, in the criminal and civil harassment and in, in the Harmful Digital Communications Act, both in the criminal and the civil side. And I go, well, you know, I'm not a lawyer. And it says in there that, you know, um, harassment is, can be classified as something that any reasonable person would find, you know, distressing and upsetting. And I'm like, well, surely this is the kind of thing that most reasonable people do. I mean, I'm constantly, people are saying, is there nothing that can be done um, to me about, about the kind of um, targeting that I receive, including, you know, death threats and pictures of hung bodies and things like that. Um, and, and apparently, no, there is very little that can be done criminally. And there is perhaps some stuff that could be done in a civil manner, but as Sarah's really pointed out, um, that is quite unsatisfactory. It does require you as, as a person to, um, to list how painful it's been. You know, it, it requires you to be really, to paint yourself as a victim when obviously I'm trying to avoid thinking about that and just get on with doing my work so that we can actually try and understand what's happening in Aotearoa. So, so that's where I'm at extraordinary that you know you can be uh, being given death threats and it's such like and the present law and agencies seem powerless to offer you any protection well um alison or mihi narangi would you like to make any comment here i'm i'm um, happy to go um kia ora koutou ko ahi tereri a toko iwi ko ali moore aho it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm uh, both blown away by um, Sarah and um, and Kate's bravery, um, and also really underwhelmed by the options open to Sarah. You know, to to have to go to the Supreme Court, and the result being simply that you were able to unmask your sorry, District Court was it, Sarah? Um, simply, to, you know, to go through all that simply to unmask the anonymous person who has been 
um, harassing you is um, ex seems extraordinary. Uh, and, you know, it can be done. I've only ever heard of one other um, example in New Zealand. There was a, a very brave woman who pursued her anonymous um, online harasser um, internationally and found out that he was, in fact, a uh, an 18 or 19 year old high school um, senior. Uh, and eventually she managed to get the, um, the police in his small town US um, uh, town to take charges against, lay charges against him, which was, but, but I suppose my point is the level of commitment that you need to have just to try and get these people to stop it uh, is frightening. And unfortunately, um, through absolutely no fault of their own, a lot of women uh, get to a point where they've run out of juice, you know, they, they've tried and tried and tried and tried, and they just can't try no more. Um, and, and they have to accept that there's nothing that they can do to, to help themselves, which is an appalling state of affairs. And perhaps, Sorry to be a downer. Just <laughs> go to you, Mahi Norangi. Um, we should perhaps mention that Sarah, it turned out that Sarah's anonymous trolls were political. They were young gnats mm. attacking her politically. So there's that dimension uh, as well. Uh, mihi nā rangi. Um, kia ora. Um, I agree with Ali. I think, you know, you guys are so brave and thank goodness for um, women like you uh, because I'm the, I'm, I think you actually reminded me this morning that you just have to continue doing those things. And I think for, you know, for me and women that I know that work in the media that are constantly trolled and harassed, we've just kind of given up. And I was just thinking, I'd actually forgotten this case that happened to me. I used to have this person who used to um, tell me he wanted to have sex with me all the time. And then it got to a point where he'd ring my phone because as a journalist, your phone number's always available. And my phone num number has been the same since 1995. And so um, I got to a point where he was ringing me and masturbating in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And I went to the police and there was nothing that could be done. I gave them all the, all the numbers and the online kind of material did a police report, had to go through, you know, talking to the police about someone masturbating and the words that they were saying and all those, it was kind of like that. And um, then he had a record apparently and I wasn't allowed to know about it because it was private. And I was like, oh, at that stage, I kind of threw my hands in the air and went and, and considered that actually the people that I deal with in Māori current affairs have way, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not, equating anybody's abuse to one another's but you know the women that I'm dealing with I've got really tough lives and stories and so it's easier for me to just pour my life into theirs and um yeah that person stopped so obviously they had a conversation with them but you know you all you have to do is listen to someone's story and then all of a sudden you can think about it of a dozen things that have happened to you or your mates or the rest of it so yeah um well done yeah i just before I come to our next question I just want to say too that um uh, to thank all of you for the courage to speak out because whenever you speak out about the sort of abuse and misogyny or well, raise your head above the parapet you're likely to incur even more abuse so it is uh, appalling and we'll come to what we can do about it um, in the second part of our webinar but just if I can come to you Kate um, so your organization the disinformation project it's been monitoring online abuse and you point out in your latest uh, research paper that abuse against women and other forms of abuse, of course, but it's been escalating over the past year and that this level of abuse of abuse and the polarizing social uh, discourse, increasingly violent social discourse, is eroding social cohesion and trust in our institutions and posing a threat to our democracy. So what is driving the online abuse against women and why is it so targeted at women in the public eye? Uh, for example, our own Prime Minister, who I think has received about 50 threats in the, uh, in the past year. And is there a risk that this sort of level of targeting and abuse will put women off uh, standing or coming forward for uh, politics and taking up leadership roles which put them in the public eye? 
Yeah, I mean, I, it's a really weighty question and I, I am loath to um, ruin everybody's day, but I'm probably about to. So, so what would have been quite um, apparent to people as they observed for the parliamentary protest and which was for most New Zealanders the first time that they really witnessed uh, the level of hatred, of violence, of, of um, a discourse that was filled with threats and, and death threats and, and also very personally targeted towards the Prime Minister and other ministers and then also journalists, both Mahi and Ali, you know, fully aware of, of that. Um, so what we've been observing over, over the course of the last year has been uh, an almost um, exponential growth of the use of violative, violent, misogynistic language and imagery to talk about any woman or any non-man or anyone that they would, would classify as being um, you know, not sort of exemplifying masculinity in the way that masculinity, a toxic masculinity frame would exemplify masculinity. That language has got more and more repellent, more vulgar, more gross. Um, it's transphobic, it's dehumanizing. Uh, it uses uh, language um, which I would call classical misogyny. So references to, um, to Eve, to witchcraft, to, to the kinds of images and ideas that are part of our stories that go back for thousands of years, our kind of cultural norms and cultural stories that, that really much vilify women, particularly powerful or outspoken women. And what we increasingly understand is that the targeted harassment of, of a woman like the Prime Minister or other women in the public eye, um, thinking particularly of the Foreign Minister, um, who is a particular um, victim of this, and also obviously with racism added to the mix there, misogynoir, as it's called, um, where that, that uh, outrage and targeted harassment we see is actually a weapon and it's designed to silence us all. It's not just about the prime minister as a woman. It is about all women, all non-men, anyone who doesn't fit the mold of, of um, you know, I hate to say it, white Anglo-Saxon men um, who have power. So it's it's about, you know, that, that definition of misogyny about controlling and punishing women who step outside the norms. And, and you know, it's linked to the global patterns we are seeing. It's linked to what we've seen take place in the United States in the last week. It is linked to ideas about the role of men, the role of women. And I talk about, you know, that, that binary um, opposition of roles of men and women really um, intensively because they view that as, as, you know, there are appropriate roles for women and inappropriate roles for men. It's about who gets to be a New Zealander uh, who gets to hold power, who gets to speak. And so these are really ideas that challenge um, what I guess we would call in legal philosophy or political philosophy, our idea of the state, you know, what the state, what our country is, what it represents. Um, and these ideas have been um, soft plateaued in through mechanisms look, that have talked about mandates and vaccines and are now openly talking about um, toxic femininity and that women should know their place and the greatest calling for a woman is to be a mother uh, and that who owns our children, we own our children, which is, you know, a, a ghastly uh, set of ideas around our own children's identities and power. I mean, uh, the group of panelists will be aware that um, when I noticed some some targeting of this particular session last week, one of the things that um, was said about the four of us um, was that we were barren whores, um, which is you know the kind of um, language that we can expect, um, and those are both very weighted, very old words, aren't they? They they hold so much weight, mm -hmm. and they they tell us so much about what people think about women when they use words like that. Mm -hmm. So we are really in a situation where there are two aspects to what I see as the, the breakdown of trust in agencies and institutions. So there's obviously, you know, the destruction, the chilling effect of women's ability to feel safe in participating in public life. Mm -hmm. But there's also 
the converse effect, the one that we've just talked about, thinking about um, the, you know, Maharani, you know, that story about um, the police not responding appropriately and Sarah that you know these stories are terrible but actually when we talk about how institutions like police and NetSafe are not supporting us that actually also then causes people who support us to have, lose their faith in institutions you know this is so so there's a double-edged sword aspect to it too the more we talk about it um the more it actually becomes a uh, a signal that institutions are failing to protect us, but we need to do that. But it also creates um, a, an ability for divisiveness to, to step in for that polarization to become worse. So, you know, this is the, the quandary that we're in. Why we need to find some institutions that we can trust in and that will yes. protect us. But I just wondered, um, Sarah, um, Thankfully, it hasn't put you off uh, standing for the Christchurch City Council again. But do you think that this whole targeting of women in public life could even put women off from standing in these upcoming local body elections as well as for national politics? Oh, absolutely. So um, this has got worse over time and um, I've noticed it get worse over time. Uh, just in my short time on council, so five and a half years now. But last election, I was a panellist on a Wahine and politics um, evening at Smash Palace in town. The, it was a packed room, lots of women really interested in either standing for election or supporting other women, actually mostly there to support other women standing for election. And uh, three of us talked about our experiences, tried to encourage people, um, but were very real about it. And uh, I had a lot of coffees with women afterwards, and I've had lots over the years, and really good women who would be amazing on council. And 99% of them are, uh, no, you know, I can make a difference in a different way. I really don't want to put myself in the position where I'm having to go through that. And so there's, there's that part of it, but there's also women who are already elected, who just pull back from the community discourse. And so while, you know, Facebook and, um, you know, Twitter and all those places have a, they do have a really excellent potential for being a really good conduit of information to and from the community. And I'm still really active on my Facebook, getting information out there, encouraging people to participate and stuff. But most of my colleagues and women um, uh, councils I've talked to across the country have just pulled back from that completely. Um, so they're not able to communicate with their community in that way. Um, and that does a real disservice to to democracy. I think one of the things is that women and, and other groups, so um, gender minorities, ethnic groups, um, Māori, those voices have been underrepresented at the table for so long, but they're the voices who are calling for change to the status quo. Mm. And it's the change, you know, the, you know, environmental action, all of those things that seem really threatening um, to those who've been in power with the BAU, with their horrible fossil fuel planet um, for, for so long. And it's that if, if we can stop those people from wanting to participate, maybe we can just stay BAU. Um, yeah. So I think it, everyone needs to understand what women like yourselves who are putting yourselves um, up there, you know, the, the price that you pay for that and uh, the need to support women who are in public life and, and who are prepared to um, put up with that level of, um, you know, risk and abuse. Well, just turning to um, journalists too, um, because they're increasingly being targeted, not just uh, women in public life or, or, or in politics, increasingly described uh, disparagingly as prostitutes. Um, presumably in, a, in an attempt to um, discredit women in the media and undermine trust generally in the media. So I was just wondering, Alison and Mihina Rangi, if you've been targeted in this way, but and also what are the effects more generally that these attacks are having on women in the media and the media generally? Maybe Alison, if you start. Um, can I defer the first words, please, to Mihi Narangi, because although I can um, claim a, um, some form of uh, 
intersectionality, um, Mihi has to deal with racism as well as misogyny. So I'd like her to have the first words, please. Um, yeah, I mean, just listening to that, some, of the, some of the research that you had done and it was interesting for us, um, well, Māori journalists and female Māori journalists, because there's so many of us at the moment, you know, <laughs> punching above the parapet, like it's been a real change in the last 10 years. But when I speak to some of my tuakana and Māori media, we're like really surprised by that kind of abuse that we were getting and where it was coming from. So we used to get like a really healthy right wing um, male white misogyny kind of abuse calling us in lovers and hideous things like that but when the whole um, anti-vax thing came along we could see this weird thing that had happened the spectrum so you'd have your kind of super right over here and then you'd have um, what we used to call Maori that were um, you know, didn't want to conform with um, imperial systems and, you know, really worthy, healthy kind of debates and conversation. Lots of them would live off the land, anti-vaccination for purpose that they're not actually interacting with, you know, public schools and stuff, and they're going to use their rongoa Māori and all those kinds of things. But it changed, and they became influenced, well, this is my opinion anyway, by a really strong American Christianity kind of thing that was happening and so when they were and, and I'm the same as um, some of these other women is when people try and have a conversation with me I'm really open to a conversation until someone becomes abusive and then I block them but I will have conversations and I don't know if anyone is on my Facebook but all through COVID I had big big conversations with hundreds and hundreds of people still having you know debate the next day and the next day and the next day and most of it was pretty healthy but there was a really interesting thread of our people that were um that we would have called the Tino Rangatiratanga cohort of our whanau who had picked up on this real American Christianity and pro-Trump and I still can't work it out um but in terms of the abuse yeah we just got the same um it just kind of ramped up and the messages changed um, and just instead of like being called a whore, it would just be a Maori whore. <laughs> so, you know, and they'd just come at us. But Alison would have had similar stuff as well. Um, yeah, I, I get a lot of upsetting stuff. Uh, I don't, and this is tempting fate, isn't it? I don't tend to get death threats uh, or rape threats, but I get called a lot of very awful things. Sorry, that's my turned it off now uh, so um, I suppose what I'm trying to say there is, is uh, I don't feel that I'm getting the worst end of it um, really interestingly uh, I you know my inbox on a Sunday and a Monday is an absolute shambles uh, because I write an opinion uh, column in the Sunday Star Times every Sunday and uh, no matter what I write or so I thought um, the abuse will flood in and if it's and I always reply to the emails if they're not abusive um, I'm a bit like you Mihi I engage if um, somebody is actually trying to make an argument even though it's you know even if it doesn't line up with how I feel and think um, but recently I wrote a, a, my op-ed on a subject that plainly did not catch the attention or the interest of any men and I didn't get a single email, which I thought was, you know, it wasn't that, um, you know, I write a lot about, um, about topics that are of interest to women and are about uh, women's rights. Uh, and after all of those columns, I get a flood of misogynist emails from men and some from women. Um, this time it wasn't, it simply wasn't a topic, obviously, that, that men felt in any way connected to, and there was no abuse at all, which I thought was, um, what was really... the top, what was the topic, Ali? Uh, the topic was, once again, this is tempting fate, um, the topic was oversharing, sharenting. Oh, sure. Overshare yes, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, images of your children, which mm. tends to be a mum thing um you know dads and uncles and grandparents do it as well of course 
Uh, but it obviously wasn't a topic that men found threatening at all, mm. I guess. Um, now, that's just an anecdote. And this is the, ne the next thing I wanted to say was um, to you, Kate, how helpful your work uh, and the work of your colleagues is to, to journalists like us, because many of our stories, you know, when I write about... Um, about sexual harassment issues, for example, I'm taking little bites at it at a time. You know, I'm I'm taking one person's story or a group of people's stories uh, and um, investigating them, and you know, hopefully bringing some accountability and some closure uh, to them. Um, but traditionally, there hasn't been that body of evidence behind what we do certainly not here in new zealand you can look for international studies and 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 they sporadically do exist um but to have somebody uh or a group of people actually looking at how misogynistic attitudes are playing out in real time as you are doing and you know i pray for your mental health um but it's so helpful to, to journalists like myself, because um, it shows you that we're not just flinging out uh, isolated examples, you know? I mean, I would argue after four years, I have a body of work that shows that harassment is not an isolated example in any way, shape or form, but, but I'm still open to, I've got plenty of people who will email or message me um, claiming that. So, you know, to, to, to have work like yours going on, looking at the really, um, the really vile stuff that, that is being said and done that we may not even know about is, is so helpful to a journalist like myself. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, here, here, Kate, because it's putting the big picture together. And, you know, when people are saying, well, is the abuse increasing? Well, you can credibly say, well, it is because we're monitoring it literally every single day. Uh, so, um, yeah, kia kaha from all of us, uh, Kate. But just coming back, Mihi, to the issue of uh, that, how, why it is that so much misogyny and racism uh, go hand in hand and how much online abuse is so often targeted, not just at women of colour and uh, Māori women, uh, wahine Māori, gender minorities, trans women, Muslim women, uh, disabled women. Why, why does it all tend to go together? Your thoughts? Um, I think, look, I have listened to the late, great Moana Jackson plenty of times and to not quote him because I couldn't, couldn't do it justice to quote him, but to kind of read into some of his whakaro around it is that this nation is founded on a backdrop of imperialism and colonization. And so we are, you know, eight generations deep. Um, you know, people who call themselves like seventh, eighth generation New Zealanders now and their, their whanau came over, you know, for this new hope with the parcel of land that they'd bought off the New Zealand company. We, it's ingrained, ingrained in us. And, um, you know, if you, you just have to look into the past to see the way that our minorities and groups of people, like, you know, our early Asian immigrations to the gold mines in the late 1800s, um, then other groups of, who have immigrated here, and then you then you get, actually see the imbalance of immigration. And so those who are rich immigrants are treated different to those who are refugees and migrants and the rest of it. So um, I'm not, we shouldn't be surprised by it. We shouldn't be surprised that people make memes out of um, a really experienced politician like Nanaya Mahuta and turn her into a mobster with a tin hat on her and call her the most hideous names that people will write into Orini Kaipara and like some of the things they say about her. You know, so we shouldn't be surprised. But what we should be surprised about is the organizations around it need to speak up and support them so Please. where is the discovery and i'm probably going to get in trouble for that you know where where are they where's the head of that organization speaking out and saying we will not tolerate this abuse of our presenter who is actually tangata whenua wahine maori in this in this country whose tupuna have been here for three thousand years um sorry sorry nine sorry i'm thinking about um 
the whole of Polynesia, sorry, 700 years. You know, that's how she whakapapas back to where she's from. And same with Naya. you know, she's a really experienced um, politician. So we're just, our organisations, our groups, we have to get form unions. That's what we've formed in broadcasting. I feel like we've got a union of women who look after ourselves. And I might not see Ali very often, but I know that she's in my union of wahine and that we can call on them. And we definitely have a union of Māori women who look after each other. I think that's an incredibly important point, and that's what Julia Gillard was saying, that for years, until she gave her wonderful, empowering, misogynistic uh, speech uh, in Parliament, which I think is now being viewed about seven million times, but before that, there was just silence. People did not come out and say this is unacceptable. And so your point about why we're not seeing people, about why we're sort of putting up with this horrific abuse against our Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs. So I think it's a really important point that that needs to ha start happening. But um, if we could move on, Alison, to you looking at this um, rise in online abuse, do you think that it's part of a global backlash against women's rights? Or is it really quite a small and vocal minority who are behind it? and trying to be positive about it, uh, can these sort of terrible setbacks, such as what had, had, has happened when almost overnight American women lo lost their constitutional uh, right to abortion, can that sometimes be a catalyst for transformational change? Uh, I think the overturning of Roe v Wade, well, I hope because I'm an optimist, um, is a galvanizing moment. Uh, and I think we can see via, via the protests uh, in the United States that are still ongoing um, that, uh, you know, there are a, a lot of people, men and women, who are determined that, um, that you know, that decision uh, will not stand. Um, there has definitely been a backlash. And I think any, any moment where we are seem to come together in great numbers um, will, as women, will, uh, will prompt a backlash. And so you know this from your um, incredible work in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and beyond, um, that there are those moments that are so powerful um, that and, and we are brought together so effectively, and Me Too is, is one of those moments, um, that it does trigger a, a quite an intense backlash. Um, there are um, a lot of people that would just like me to shut up and go and, and report on something else now, please, because we've had that now. We've talked about that now. Yeah. Could you please just stop? We, you know, we're over that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not over it. While while women uh, and and some men uh, uh, continue to be treated in these appalling ways in their workplace, where while they are unable to go to work and have a happy time doing their work um, because of the actions of somebody else, um, I certainly won't be stopping. But there are. Um, many, many people who, who wish I would. Uh, yeah. And I think that is, um, I don't know whether it's an organised, I mean, Kate would know better than I do um, because she looks at, at in those dark, dark places. Um, I don't know whether it's an organised uh, or a, um, or just a general backlash uh, you know, Me Too was is not it was never an organised movement. It was just an explosion oh, of God. feeling and disgust from billions of women who were sick of it. Um, it was it it didn't have really any form, any formal shape. Uh, you know, and and a lot of people who criticise it seem to be expecting it to expecting me too to be rolled out in some kind of mm. organized yeah. manner but it's it's not like that it was like a, a simple explosion of 
frustration from women all over the world. Um, and it certainly has uh, engendered a backlash and a big one. And Kate, you might like to comment on it because I think in your paper, you say that really it's quite a small minority who are really at the front line of this particularly, um, you know, this backlash what it manifests as abuse against women, uh, particularly anonymously online. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's a couple of strands I'll, I'll try and draw to here, together here. And I really want to talk on Mithi for, for laying out that ground to say that this is about um, imperialism, yeah. you know, the, the colonial project um, and the harms that have been caused by the colonial project are writ large in our societies and, and on people's bodies and, and in their experiences of life. And so one of the things that we see in our work is that um, COVID-19 mis and disinformation was a sort of, was a Trojan horse. It was something that, you know, enabled people to then be exposed to other forms of mis and disinformation. But misogyny and anti-Māori racism in particular are two other Trojan horses in Aotearoa, New Zealand, because they are so normal. They are so normal and usual that people don't notice for quite a long time that they're getting worse. And so casual racism, casual sexism drew people into discourses that then became more and more violent, more and more upsetting, more and more targeting of individuals and groups. But it was a, they were able to do that because it's so much a part of, of actually our culture, that, that misogyny, that, that low level misogyny. So the jokes you know, from two years ago about the nanny and about Jacinda's marriage or partnership have now become, you know, jokes that I can't even begin to frame here because it's too upsetting. But those jokes were quite socially acceptable in that misogynistic framework. And so, so there's that aspect of, of what we're seeing here, particularly in Aotearoa. And then um, to Ali's point about whether there is sort of a, a, a structural backlash, um, you know, uh, in, in preventing encountering violent extremism, which is another space that I now find myself working in because the links between disinformation and violent extremism are becoming more and more apparent. Um, we no longer, well, sensible people no longer really think about um, people joining a terrorist organization and getting trained and then going and conducting themselves as a terrorist. We, we think about what a thing that's called stochastic terrorism, which is that it can kind of build and build and build and pop off at any point. Um, but what I would call from my like way of thinking about things, um, stuff that is slow violence that then migrates to explosive violence. And as, as women, as indigenous women, as, as uh, women of color, um, as people of color across you know, New Zealand and other places know that slow violence, the racism, uh, the sexual violence, the sexual harm, all of all of the violences that are enacted um, are often dismissed and, and misunderstood as we've described as kind of individual and personal and private matters. But they're actually examples of the build up to that explosive violence. Um, you know, we, we have obviously had um, the director of SIS say earlier this year that, that, you know, that the level of misogyny is such that it's quite hard for um, those people who are actually watching the violent extremist spaces to ascertain what is a real threat and what is just this noise of constant misogyny and violence, mm. um, particularly also targeting ethnic communities and Māori communities. And, and so this is it doesn't need to be a sort of signed up program, a kind of I'm joining the backlash because everyone's joining it um, and enacting it in different ways. And the consequences, the impact of it are such that um, we will be silenced or that silencing will take place. So, you know, that, that kind of distinction between intent and impact is something that we've started to sort of stop worrying about is what the impact of it will be is our main concern. Well, I think, you know, that, that's um, very powerfully put, um, Kate, but I think if we now turn to what on earth can we do about it, um, 
I mean, the legal remedies against women who are targeted, as um, Sarah, you've pointed out, they're limited to making an application to the district court under the Harmful Communications Act. And as you've pointed out, Sarah, you know, it's quite a performance. You've got to be very motivated to put in the application to go through. It's time consuming. So, you know, so many women feel, as we've said, powerless uh, against or in the face of this abuse. So, Sarah, do you want to just describe what you had to go through briefly um, and why you think NetSafe, which is the agency, it's supposed, supposedly an independent agency, that has a mandate to deter, prevent, and mitigate online harassment. Why is it so obviously failing in its mandate? But, uh, um, oh, it's, um, it's really tough. So I was really lucky um, in many ways with mine. So my harassment and abuse had stopped before I um, had to go through a process. So I'd been, I'd, um, I'd contacted NetSafe, uh, who I was told would help me through um, working out what to do and help me with the process. But it took a while, so uh, I started with an email, um, rearranged a phone call, and I had to provide them with evidence to show that I had been harassed, um, which is not easy. So it's a case of screenshots and those kind of things, but actually you need to date those. You need to try and work out how to screenshot things so that um, so that it's clear where they're from and that you haven't changed them in some way. And each individual screenshot doesn't look like much. You know, I know that, you know, the social media and things, they have a, you know, a, a tolerance level where it's an actual kind of personal threat before they'll take any down um, pretty much. But when you get a pattern of things and you put them up on screenshots, you're like, yeah, that doesn't look that bad. Um, you know, would a reasonable person be harassed by this and, and feel an anxious and stuff? Um, so you have to show to NetSafe that there's been harm, which means admitting to a stranger um, what you've been going through and how, it, how it's had an impact on you. And that's really not easy. Um, you know, we're conditioned to be nice as women, you know, you grow up and you be nice to people and you turn the other cheek and you ignore, you, you ignore comments, um, all of those societal expectations. And you also, you know, you don't want people to think that you can't do your job properly. Um, you know, a bit of harassment that just goes with the job, that kind of thing. So admitting the harm is really tough. Uh, so NetSafe go through this process and they go, well, you could block them. I'm like, well, I've done that hasn't worked and they're like well you could I don't know what could you do and it was it was really difficult because there weren't really many options and like what would you like to do and I'm like well I don't know what my options are um and NetSafe it, it advised me because I wanted to work out who was behind it they advised me not to report the harassment because if um Facebook took things down then um then there wouldn't be enough time to go through a court process before Facebook deleted things like it, like it regularly does. But actually it turns out um, from conversations I've now had with Facebook that if Facebook take things down, they actually save them um, for, a, for a period of time. So I had to write a, um, a letter and I had to send a paper copy of a letter to Facebook's lawyers over in California to ask them to, to preserve the data associated with those fake accounts so that I would have enough time to go through a court process in New Zealand to work out who was behind them. Um, but through most of that, that took months to hear back from Facebook. Um, yeah, but they did, They um, the lawyers got in contact, Facebook preserved the data. Um, my harassment stopped when I went public and so I had the time, space and, and energy after recovering to go through the court process. But that itself um, took sort of uh, four or five months. And um, it's just not easy. And I decided that it was the, H, the HDC 8 processes itself and filing things in at the, the district court is a civil process. And so it's you against Facebook. Me, my case is Templeton versus Facebook, which is... Um, sounds kind of bigger than it is, um, but it meant that I had to file papers myself. 
the process is in theory designed that you can do it without a lawyer. So I decided to test that um, and did the whole thing without a lawyer. Um, and yeah, so that's, you know, putting together my affidavit and getting that witness and those kind of things. Did, um, um, did NetSafe see its role as advocating for you, helping you in this process? No, no. And they were really, they were really clear that they couldn't help me with any of that stuff. Um, they provide you with a what's called a summary, a net safe summary, and you have to have a net safe summary to approach the court. And I had assumed that the net safe summary would be like a summary of all the information I'd given them um, to help me with my court process. And it's this weird half page thing. Um, it's a table that's pretty much unintelligible. Um, and I had to start up from scratch again, um, putting my stuff together for the for the courts. Right. But so, I mean, what we're re what you're really saying is it's a, it's a long, complicated process. NetSafe doesn't see itself as an advocate. There's no one-stop shop, and NetSafe um, they're not even a, a government agency. A and I wonder how many women in New Zealand realise that that that's where they should be going anyway. And um, I noticed that it's got um, Facebook and all of those. It's got working partners with you know Facebook and Google and whatever. So you wonder just how genuinely independent they are. Um, but clearly uh, that process is grossly inadequate and the law is, uh, and NetSafe is failing us. But Kate, um, in your paper, you, you make the point that the perception that uh, agencies are inactive, um, that the ones that are responsible allegedly for public safety, and in, um, such as NetSafe and the police, the, the perception that there's you know, it's all hopeless and that they're not really going to be there to support us is undermining uh, public trust. So what would you like to see agencies such as the police and uh, net safe and whatever doing to protect women and girls or women such as yourselves and, and others on the panel here? Uh, kia ora, thanks. So um, sadly, I would like to inform you all that my harasser is actually on the call um, oh, now. His apparently live telegram posting about it. Um, so you know we've tried our best. I know, I know you have. So, so I'm just we'll just we'll yeah. we'll just continue. Just price of. Mm. Um, but if I'm not as clear as I always would be, then that will be why. Um, so I think the thing is is that um, the legislation, the regulatory and legislative. Um, options for us a myriad so you know obviously Sarah's talked about um, their problems with capturing data so you know if you report something to Facebook or to Meta or you know Meta broadly so Instagram or to Twitter um, it's likely to get taken down and then you don't have a record of the content and and people don't have a very clear idea of what kind of evidentiary um, method in which content needs to be saved in order to take a process either through the platform's own guidelines and regulations or through um, the Harmful Digital Communications Act or through other recourse that people might have um, with you know through other police interventions. So what happens is that it all feels far too hard uh, and there is no one there is no one who is advocating as Sarah said to just support you through that process and and I've seen in the last year you know Sarah's story and stories of other women um, engaging with NetSafe and the Harmful Digital Communications Act who had to push and push and push and they have all been you know women um, who have are lawyers or journalists or you know highly educated high, have high access to um, support networks um, have access to those um, unions or you know those ad hoc networks that you talked about Mahi and Ali to support them through those processes and if it's hard for us for those women yeah. imagine how much harder it is for other people and you know, the issues are structural in, in the regulatory frameworks and they aren't victim focused. And they're also not victim focused um, in a way that acknowledges that this is not an interpersonal harm. You know, this is not the same as somebody sharing my nudes. This is targeted harassment by a complete stranger um, because they don't like my, my research work and what they assume about my political opinions 
uh, in much the same way that, that Sarah was also targeted by complete strangers um, as a woman, but because of political or social values and ideas. And you know, these, this is really problematic. So we, we significantly need change, um, operational change and training for police, operational change to the ability to report to Police 105. We need to make it much easier for people to make complaints to the platforms. And we should probably have um, organizations and advocacy groups that help people make reports to platforms um, in ways that platforms will pay attention to. Because if Facebook, for example, um, own uh, tier three categorization of misogyny was in use, then we wouldn't see the C word repeatedly used about the prime minister all over Facebook, because that word, the C word in itself, is actually categorized as, you know, when it's used against women as, as misogyny on Facebook's own platform guidelines, but it would take them to implement them appropriately. So we need that advocacy level to also support us as women and as um, other minorities in these spaces. But the review of the Harmful Digital Communications Act that Sarah's calling for mm -hmm. is probably the most pressing issue because at the moment the act does not protect us as victims. Absolutely, well, I, I just um, want to say, you know, thank you, um, Kate, for being here and to salute your bravery and to, uh, to how terrible for you that this ridiculous harasser is um, targeting you even uh, here today and we need to do what we can collectively to support you in particular Kate because um, as others have said your work is so important and um, you know why should you have to pay this very high price just for reporting on uh, this horrific abuse. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that but uh, Alison I just maybe you could just comment on why I mean, a lot of these online abusers, they're anonymous and why? And, and so they face no consequences. They can, you know, you attack women all over the place online and they seem to have no consequences. They can do it with impunity. Um, and isn't this part of the reason we're seeing so much of this online abuse? And it should one of the things we need to look at be uh, requiring technology companies to reveal the identity of anonymous abusers? Uh, yes, although that's harder than it sounds, isn't it? Um, I, I personally love the idea of everybody online using their own name uh, and, and, and being verified. Uh, I understand um, that the, the most common argument against that is that it is simply not safe for for some people to be on platforms like Twitter or whatever it might be, uh, using their own name. Um, certainly I would be able to have more interactions uh, with less abuse if I was using an anonymous profile, uh, but I don't do that because I believe it's important that people know who I am and what I stand for. Um, so, I mean, the answer is, is absolutely yes. It should not be, uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of targeted abuse, it should not be this difficult to find out who your uh, harasser is. I happen to know who Kate's harasser, who's on this call is. Um, perhaps we should have a separate conversation about that, Kate, at some point. Um, yeah, getting the getting the uh, the tech platforms to do anything meaningful is fiendishly hard. I, I'm working on an investigation into um, uh, the company behind Pornhub at the moment, uh, who swear black and blue that they uh, and they and they're being sued in a big way in the United States at the moment and in Canada. Um, that company and the men who run it swear black and blue that they, they're doing all they can to, you know, um, to uh, reduce the harm, which in Pornhub's case uh, uh, includes um, child rape and exploitation and the monetizing of that, of those crimes. 
Um, but until very recently, for a, a, a you know a platform that hosts billions or certainly millions of videos, user-generated videos, um, until quite recently, they only had 80 moderators worldwide. Um, so it's very easy for, for tech platforms to say that they're doing all they can when um, absolutely plainly they are not. Mm. Uh, you know, there is some class action suits um, against this kind of exploitation in the US and Canada, as I said, at the moment. Um, and we're yet to see how those will play out. Um, but generally, you find that uh, that big tech doesn't move until they're absolutely forced to move. And even then, the movements that will keep people like, um, well, keep women and children safe, people safe, uh, are incremental in their, um, in the, you know, they, they are uh, installed in tiny, tiny, tiny increments and only under extreme pressure. Um, the only answer to that, I believe, is um, better and tighter legislation. Which brings you us know, legislation. We can't... Regulation. Uh, yeah. Regulation and, and legislation always falls badly behind um, the, the technological progress. We know that. So we are miles behind um, where we should be in terms of um, keeping, you know, regulation that keeps people safe online. Which brings us to legislation. I mean, clearly we can't rely on the, uh, the, the, the technology companies, so we need to rely on our own government and it's our law is failing us manifestly. Um, so where do, where do we go? I know that Sarah has written to the Minister of Justice calling for a view of the Harmful Digital, Digital Communications Act. Um, Mihi, in Scotland, the government is actually proposing, they've done a big um, review of misogyny and they're proposing to legislate against misogyny, make it an offence to stir up hatred against women or girls, or to issue threats of rape and sexual assault against women and girls. Do we need to go sort of down that route or should we just be asking for um, the review of the of our own existing harmful digital communications act, which is so obviously um, out of date and failing us? Uh, you know, where do we go? And also, of course, legislation takes a while to change. What do we do in the meantime? Mihi, your thoughts? <laughs> Um, this is not my area of expertise, so uh, Sarah and Kate and Alison should jump in on this, but of course I would support any legislation that would make illegal the threat of rape of women and children, um, hands down. But, you know, for, I guess, as a Maori woman, like laws and legislations and rules and procedures haven't really protected mm -hmm. us. And um, I think that we've always tried, that's why we talk about building our groups and support around each other. Um, and if I, and again, I just go back to like, we have to have better expectations of our fellow, our women and our men and the people and the organizations that we work with and our families and our communities and our schools and all those things. And if I think about probably when my, the, the online abuse got really bad, it was, you know, it was actually journalists that created that for me and they were Pākehā men. And I did an interview once with Alice Dear Thompson that kind of went a bit crazy and the online support that I got from women was like yeah Mahi, you gave it to him but no one really condemned him like publicly and in fact Brian Edwards called me dishonest and that became like the the, the he googled my name and it came up dishonest journalist for years and then stuff you know they did a story on me stealing clothes and I'm called a thief all the time all the time this is before the good the good people came to some good people came to stuff and wouldn't have had that but this is years and years and years ago so i'm all about um we have to hold our own to account um i'll let these other women talk about the legislation but i think i grew up with a mother who was called a witch and a whore you know for speaking into spaces around uh, you know women against pornography and all those kinds of groups her great grandmother was spat at for peddling around the petition and so i'm simply doing what those before me have done for 
my children and my grandchildren. So what we do today in Cage, good on you for staying on here and speaking and continuing because what you do today will mean something for the future and that's really, really important. But I will give it to these other wahine to talk about the legislation. Who would like to comment on where we go with this legislation? Um, can I just... Uh... Vera. Uh, Mahita Mahinarangi for that, that it's um, you're completely right with calling our own out as well. I know that um, I have uh, colleagues that sometimes put things up on social media that are that are inflammatory, um, designed to um, raise issues that they feel passionate about in a way that um, that means that people on their Facebook page is commenting. Um, target me more and I know when when they've put up inflammatory posts I get more commentary I get more emails I get more stuff on my page all of that kind of thing and that's difficult as a counsellor um, because we're all elected and we all have our own you know people that we re represent but it's um it definitely happens and it happens relatively frequently um, which is really disappointing um, but when it comes to the act itself I think there's there's two key things for me that seem to be the the overarching things that that need addressing one is um civil versus um criminal and so you know if, if i was walking down the street and a stranger came up and punched me i wouldn't be expected to take civil action to find a remedy for that um to find out who they were what their name is or to try and get them to apologize those kind of things you know, it would be a police matter mm -hmm. but the same is not um it doesn't occur for online harm, and and it should. Um, and uh, you know, another one is if you were, you know, running a red light. Um, the intent is really important. So if you run a red light um, because you're distracted, something happens, a kid vomits in the back seat, that kind of thing, and you end up hitting another car and injuring someone, mm -hmm. you still face the justice system, but. The intent behind whether you ran the red light or not might be taken into account with what happens to you after you've been through the system and what happens to you might be quite different to someone who was you know um you know fleeing the police deliberately after speeding and those kind of things and ran the red light deliberately to get away the intent is taken into account um at the sentencing for example yeah. whereas the intent they have to intend to harm you under the digital harmful digital communications act and I um, was talking to a police officer who said it would be really difficult because if the guys who were harassing me, if they were just sitting around having a few beers and thought it was fun, it would be hard to take them to court, mm. um, even though it caused harm. Mm. And so those two things that sort of the, the justice versus the um, civil processes and intent, I think, are the two key things there. Yeah, Tautoko, Sarah, those are exactly the places that I would, would also say we need to address. and and. The intent issue is is really difficult um, in that um, you know that's where that police really struggle to to lay charges because um, they you know perhaps this person just intends to you know listen to us talking about misogyny and learn from us today. Well, um, in fact, we have we now really need to open up for questions, um, but just before we do. Um, We'll certainly be following up with uh, Sarah's letter so that the National Council of Women will be uh, supporting very strongly your request for review of uh, the Harmful Digital Communications Act, but also of NetSafe, which I think is quite manifestly failing. And it's all very well, but it'll take a, quite a long time to get the legislation reviewed. And we need some improvement in processes and support uh, for women in this uh, facing this sort of targeted abuse um, right now, you know, not in three years time. So um, we, we'll definitely be following up um, after this webinar, but right now um, we have some questions from the audience. And um, so, uh, shall I just read out? But a lot of them are saying, thank you for sharing your stories. They're even more than I was expecting. I'm infuriated for you all, um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, here's a barrister. Our, our legal development that we need is a new tort of harassment 
this would not require legislation and would require or would provide an alternative to the Harmful Digital Communication Act. Um, thank you for, for those who have written in that we can't get to, such as this lawyer coming up with some very, uh, very excellent suggestions. We will uh, follow up with you subsequently and uh, tremendous lots and lots of messages thanking you for bringing these everyday experiences uh, into the light, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, Eileen, do you know? Yes? So Alan. sorry, there is one, I've been keeping an eye on the questions and there's one in there that, that I might be able to usefully Wonderful. Um, address. Wonderful. Uh, question i won't i won't mention the the, the woman's name i'm um, um, just because i think that's safer and isn't isn't it ridiculous that we have to take those measures um but it's around how do you address that real low level misogyny and this woman is talking yes. about being in meetings as a, at work as a young woman and being called girl and young woman you know that kind of kind of low level belittling mm. yes indeed um so i sit on the national advisory council on the employment of women and we happened to have a meeting yesterday and i asked the wahine toa what their advice would be for that situation or similar situations um and uh they, you know, they, these are women who have a lot of experience in gov governance. Um, and they said two things. First of all, the, the allies in the room need to step up, um, you know, and a, a bit more firmly and openly. Um, but one of the things that uh, one of the uh, women does is um, if she's observed... Um, some of this kind of behaviour uh, at a, a board meeting, for example. At the next meeting, she will talk uh, as she opens the meeting about how we're going to behave in this room. And she links it very carefully back to the, the, the organisation's standards. So, for example, if they have a code of conduct and somebody in the room, however, you know, just joking, uh, the comment is, if it is in breach of that code of conduct, she can use that kind of high level structural language to remind people that that's unacceptable. And you do, that's useful because you do need to shut down that low level stuff as quickly as and as firmly as you possibly can. Because as Kate has described to us, it balloons into um, bigger problems. That's exactly, that's where it starts. Um, a couple of the, the women that I was talking to said that some of their colleagues just don't notice it. Mm. So while the young woman that asked the question here will be sitting in that meeting burning with fury about this, you know, low-level misogyny, there will be others in the room, possibly older, you know, white Pākehā men, um, who who it's simply gone straight over their head so we do need to call it out you know they they might uh they might not like it being called out or they might agree with it and just haven't noticed it um i i, I think we all need to commit to being more more vocal about it and for that young woman if you do have a manager who's in those meetings um who you feel safe to go to um, I, I would approach that person and ask if they could um, could bring it up in those in that framework of ESG that most companies have these days. You know, within that framework of of this is how we behave because this is our code of conduct or these are our company's values. You know, and Tom, we don't behave like that. Thank you. Going forward, yeah. does that make sense? Very good um, advice. Um, and as you say, as Kate, you said so powerfully, it's become so normalised that people, you know, don't even think, well, they just think it's a normal part of the price we pay for being a woman. We just put up with it. Uh, we don't speak out about it. Um, and then the, the, the people, the agencies, just sort of think it's normal too. So I think that's uh, uh, incredibly important. Can I, can I just share a small tip? Um, that I've always found, I've 
Kate, just before you do, someone says, can't we remove the harasser from the Zoom? I'm assuming that the harasser has come in on a um, anonymous account, which is why uh, we we're not able to. Yes, um, just yeah. to explain. So, Kate. Um, one of the, so I've worked as a woman um, in science for quite a long time. So that's, you know, means that, you know, you're often a minority. And one of my um, really dear friends, who's also a woman in science, she's a professor, um, has this great trick and uh, it does actually work really, really well. And it's, it's, it's a starting point for those meeting based harassments that, that Ali has just talked about is to just ask people to repeat themselves. And I thought it seemed really foolish in the beginning when she first told me about it. But if you say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Yeah. And they have to say it again. They often really pull back from whatever it was that they just said. And it also, if they go on with it, if they, say it, if they do say it again, it's much more likely that other people in the meeting will actually hear or acknowledge the, the terrible thing they've said. I know that seems really fussy, but I've actually found it to be a really powerful tool that I've used myself to just go, oh, sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Or the other one that's great is to say, oh, is that supposed to be funny? Because people don't like it when they're not funny. And, so just and getting them to explain why it's funny. Oh, yeah. explain oh, why that's funny for me, please. I don't understand <laughs> the joke. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So these are the, I mean, you know, we do, we need to start from the tips and, and tools that we use in our everyday lives through to changing legislation. Yeah. And I think having a national conversation about it, indeed having a national campaign about it, about it, and perhaps getting a coalition of organisations across the board so that we can come out and support people like you, Kate, and there's so much support um, in the chat you'll see for you today but we all want to support you so it's how we're going to support you um but yes uh, we we and also i think part of this conversation is to make policy makers aware of how how acute this problem is and the harm that it is causing so that they will speed up the legislative process and not just put it on the back burner and and you know allegedly it's on the work program but it keeps being slipped off so Certainly, um, we've got another uh, about another five minutes to hear questions, but we certainly hope that many of you will want to support us in following up this issue and we'll make some suggestions at the end of the webinar. Eileen, have you got a few other suggestions for questions? Ah, oh, um, katoa. Um, Ko Eileen Brown, Toku Ingua. Yes, there's been a lot of questions and also a lot of chat and a huge amount of support for people who have spoken out today and just uh, commending the bravery and the courage and the honesty. Um, a question that came um, for some questions that have come forward, and we'll have to, we've collected those questions. Uh, questions on the role of the police and what, um, what more do we want from the police we've had we had several questions what role should they take what should they do and when should they step in to resolve abuse i'll just draw your attention to a couple of other questions we thought were significant on um uh on the role of one was a question on covid and has there been um, has there been an increase in the online abuse of women at, with the working from home and individuals being isolated? So do the panelists have any thoughts about that? People are more easily able to hide behind anonymity. Um, Kate, questions about uh, what the uh, organizations are behind disinformation and increasing violence. So if we just put those questions there and see how we go. Anyone who would like to comment, absolutely. I'm really happy to comment on the um, the COVID and the on increase in online abuse, not just of women, but more broadly. So one of the things that um, our data shows is that during uh, um, the Delta lockdown, we, sh we saw a, a remarkable instantaneous change in the circadian rhythm of people's consumption of social media in disinformation spaces. So um, producers of disinformation were sharing stuff later into the night and earlier in the morning, and consumers were participating in conversations over that period of time. So clearly, people's health and well-being was being detrimentally impacted by their engagement on social media and, and by the um, you know, the kind of um, flood of disinformation they were exposing themselves to, which then um, you know created 
more propensity towards online abuse. Also over that period of time is when we saw the language significantly change um, to be increasingly more vulgar and more violent and violative. Um, I say vulgar and I always feel a bit like my mother when I say vulgar, like I'm, I'm totally fine with people swearing. That's cool. I am a New Zealander. We do, we do swear quite a bit. But I actually am at the point where I'm going to be saying goodness gracious for the rest of my life because I, I can't bear swearing anymore because there's just so much of it. Um, and it's so normal. And the use of um, particularly the C word, and uh, obviously we've had staff, you know, do that ex expose of, of the use of the C word, um, which was really great to see that published in the newspaper to really show people that that was what was happening. And, and so, um, you know, Definitely, we have seen that there has been a COVID effect, which means that I do hope that as we do emerge back into our um, offline spaces and places over the next few months, as it's safer, hopefully safer to do so, um, that we can consciously go into it with equipped to say, hey, we don't going to talk to each other like that and, and kind of bring the discourse back into a space that is a little bit more um, able to. Um, have us discuss our differences in ways that are helpful instead of ways that are harmful. Um, but I also, um, I'm not really gonna talk about the organizations behind the disinformation because when I name them, that um, always causes me more um, harm, um, sorry. Um, the increasing violence um, is being normalized through a thing called dangerous speech, which is speech which encourages people to think of one group as an in-group and one group as an out-group. And one of the key features of dangerous speech is the threat of harm to women and girls. And that's why we see this weird mixture of, of misogyny directed towards people like ourselves and then like um, validating and supporting women uh, who are parts of the movement, because when you have a threat of harm towards women and girls, that is uh, signals to men that they should behave in ways that protect women and girls. So there's a very deeply rooted um, kind of cultural tropes that are hard for people to step away from. So you know, that's one of the things we're seeing. Mihi. So I was just um, processing that corridor because I um, appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I'm still called a girl at 50 with four kids and I'm kind of used to it and I was thinking, oh, yeah, those those uh, suggestions would work in some spaces. But I think um, just for this audience, because we probably have different cultures here and I was thinking about that if you're in a room culturally, you know, saying that to a Māori male who might, because Māori, Māori often say e hine e tama, and they don't mean like um, a 12 year old e hine sometimes could just be like a like a gesture and it does mean girl but it just means someone younger than you it, it could be and I was thinking that's kind of confrontational that kind of suggestion of like what do you mean by that you know can you explain yourself and I thought that I think that it's important to say here is that um for different cultures that might not be the suggestion or yeah. the right way to do it and actually it would be great for the National Women's Council to have a diverse panel where you know women from different cultures can talk to experts in those areas. Um, Māori women have a bit of a cheekier way of dealing with that kind of stuff and um, yeah you know I've had to do it in times and I think that probably other cultures will have something similar too so yeah, I wouldn't go doing that to like a, you know, like a older Maori male because I think it would turn into a bit of a scrap. Some would be fine, but yeah, there's probably better ways of doing it. Yeah, kia ora, yeah. absolutely. To say something. Yeah, can I just um just before we finish, uh, just address a couple of things I've seen pop up, yep. and that my experience happened to be with a couple of fake accounts, yep. and there's been a couple of comments that people have said actually a lot of people aren't. Um, using anonymous and it, absolutely and I do get targeted by people who use their real name as well and that, that's in some ways more prevalent um, but also a few people who've talked about how depressing some of this is and I do want to say that you know I went through the process it wasn't easy but I did find out who it was and I'd still encourage people to to make the attempt to go through it and to to not um to not just block and turn away and, and switch off. 
um, and also someone else who, you know, um, questions whether she'd, you know, encourage her daughter to go into politics. Um, and actually, this is where the changes happen, um, and where we where we need lots of really good women and um, Maori and um, other minority groups um, to be involved and to have their voices represented around the table mm. so that we can do better and be better um, as a society. So. Absolutely, Taitoku to that, um, Sarah. And we've got to remember that the objective of uh, Kate's abuser and others is to silence us. That is their goal. So we cannot be silenced. We must uh, fight back and um, organise and mobilise and support each other and change the law, which regrettably uh, brings us to the end of this. We're coming to the end. But just to say, look, we, uh, the National Council of Women, we're going to be following up, as I've said, with this discussion, supporting Sarah's call for review of the Harmful Digital Communications Act and of NetSafe and of its processes, and hoping to see uh, this you know, national debate emerge on this important issue. And Mihi has just made a, a very good suggestion in that regard. So um, if you'd like to support us or in, in this mahi or in uh, joining or becoming involved with the National Council of Women, um, I think we've got a, a contact which might be put up, influence at ncwnz.org.nz. The webinar has been recorded and will be put up um, on uh, the NCWNZ Facebook page. That's the National Council of Women's Facebook page. So uh, I want to end by thanking the panellists, as so many others have, for their extraordinary courage in, um, I'll come to you, Mihi, that's fine, in, you know, speaking, speaking up on these issues. Um, and I think, you know, for your very, very powerful uh, contributions today. Also, I just want to thank the team at the National Council of Women, particularly Eileen, uh, Amy, Randolph, uh, Kerry and Liz. We have been, put a lot of effort to try to prevent um, the potential abuse of our uh, webinar and unfortunately we've failed in that regard but we um, we have tried very hard and we want to thank everyone who's participated in this webinar and um, and who would like to follow up and particularly the panelists who are here today and Mihi Rangi if you would like I'll hand over to you. I, yeah, just to take some of this weight off us before we end the day. Hoki tato ki atato tika nga Maori, iti mata ki te karakia, me motu hoki ki te karakia, nga mana ki tanga, ki runga i a atuahi, ngaro ki runga i a tato kato, tu taua mai i runga, tu taua mai i raro, tu taua mai i roto, tu taua mai i waho, ki a taua i te Maori tu, te Maori ora ki te kato, haumi e hui e, Hi. 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 Kia ora, thank you very much. That brings us to an end and we look forward to hearing from you and, con and contacting us if you would like to follow up. Thank you so much again. Thank you.